Athens, Texas. Haywood Hale Brune at the Astrodome in Houston. Haywood Hale Brune at Yankee Stadium in New York. Welcome to Woody's World. I know him as Woody. I'm Bud Lamoro. We were a television team exploring the America of the 1960s and 70s, looking for the big stories and the not-so-little ones. And every Saturday night on the CBS Network News, there was Woody Broom with his merry mustache, his loud jackets, and his suitcase full of words. Oh, what words. World Series crowds in New York tend to look like giant stockholders' meetings. For the Mets, however, even boardroom types lose their cool and scream like the t-shirted regulars of the summer season. Woody's World remembers the 1969 New York Mets, the Miracle Mets, the team with heart and soul and destiny. We expected to maybe finish uh, in the middle of the pack and uh, maybe not have a shot at anything, really. I think it's the maturity in the guys. Uh, they're all, all young. We're all young. When we were the worst, they loved us, and now that we're possibly the best, I think they'll love us. And not only New York fans, listen to Woody Brune. The nation has made pets of the Mets. It is hard not to get caught up in the mania. Look at the fans! Met runs were as common as grapes in Burgundy. And to the team which spent seven years in an arid wilderness, they were delicious. As triumph ran down the chins of the Mets and the runs ran up like a nightclub check. The exciting march of the Miracle Mets. Woody is there every step of the way. It all begins in 1962, when the new expansion Mets lose the most games of any team in the 20th century. Vinegar Ben Mizell dishes up a pitch which Joe Adcock belts into oblivion. Say what you may about the Mets pitchers, but never call them stingy. By 1968, they are lovable, yet still mediocre. But they have a dedicated owner, baseball's first woman president, and they have hope, as Woody finds out. For many Long Island ladies, the rhythm of the day is expressed in the ruffle of bridge cards, the tinkle of teacups, and the soft chunk of garden shears. For Mrs. Joan Payson, the good days are marked by the cheers of Met baseball fans and the crack of Met bats. Is there a special problem being a lady owner in baseball? No, the only dis real disappointment I think I've had is not being laid allowed to go down on the, in the dugout or on the field before the game. I thought at least the owner would be allowed to do that. Faithful and ever hopeful historian of Met Miseries, Mrs. Payson has a hieroglyph for every heartbreak, whether it be a rare book or an all too common error. Mrs. Payson used to own a half million dollar share in the Giants and Willie May. Willie will always own a share in her rooting. So when Matt Fielding turns his routine fly ball into a double, her emotions are as mixed as the Met lineup. The lady is a sport, however, and when May's second double of the day cost her team its third tough defeat of the short season, she marched out undiscouraged, if a little bemused, by the limited role of the only lady owner in a world where you can hardly see the boardrooms for the cigar smoke. It used to be said, or it was said, that when you at one time had a share in the Giants, yes. and that when you divested yourself of your giant stock in order to become owner of the Mets, you offered to let them have the stock and you could have Willie Mays. Is that yes. so? We had a feeling they wouldn't accept, though. She loves all who served in her ragged regiment, and the young Mets, some of them not so ragged, return the feeling. Tom Seaver shows her how, if she has the occasion, to throw a curveball. And Jerry Kuzman brightens her scorecard with the happy marks of giant outs. Then, even in the theaters and art galleries which are part of her world, Mrs. Payson is likely to talk not of Shakespeare, but of Swoboda. Then, when she speaks of Bosch, she means outfielder Don instead of painter Hieronymus. Then the Mets are something more than the profitable joke they have been since their first faltering steps in 1962. Profits don't mean much to the lady who was willing to give a fortune in stock for the final pages of the Mays legend. She is a throwback to the old days when owners threw profits over the fence 
in the search for men who could hit the ball over the fence. This is Haywood Hale Brune at Shea Stadium in New York. Coming up, it's 1969, and a lone Mets fan with a portfolio of mixed messages prepares us for a wild ride down history's highway on Woody's World, the Miracle Mets. What if the person of your dreams is out there waiting for you? And what if this weekend only, eHarmony introduced you to that person absolutely free? Announcing the free communication weekend from eHarmony, where we match you with other singles based on 29 dimensions of compatibility, like intellect, values, and character. And this weekend only, you can communicate with your compatible matches for free. The eHarmony free communication weekend, this Thursday through Sunday, four days only. So get started today at eHarmony.com. value, I think of something that's going to last. Something that's priced right. I think of Wrangler. Always have. For unbeatable comfort and value, you can count on Wrangler 5-star premium denim jeans. Built comfortable with a relaxed fit. Priced right for a great value. You can pay more, but you won't get more. Wrangler. Real. Comfortable. Jeans. Tough call. Well, during the Volkswagen Sign and Drive event, you can get a Jetta, Tiguan, or award winning CC for practically just your signature. And Volkswagen even covers scheduled maintenance at no cost. It can't be that easy. That was pretty easy. Sign and Drive is back. Hurry in and get legendary Volkswagen value for practically just your signature. By 1969, New York Met fans, symbolized by this mild-mannered graphic artist, are not giving up. But after seven years of never being over 500, never being in first place, they are almost resigned to never being close enough to smell the roses. Then the season gets underway, and Woody thinks Carl Earhart, the sign maker, might be on to something. For years, the Mets, as the world's worst ball club, have inspired the special attention given to scrawny kids, runt puppies, and birds with broken wings. Now, even though they're climbing, blinking into the mild sunshine of mediocrity, the lost cause lovers are sticking with them. Sentiments on sheets and shirt cardboards has long been a part of the therapy which has helped fans to tolerate the Mets. Most are heartfelt and unreadable but commercial artist Carl Earhart brings a loving expertise to his library of terse advices. Earhart, an old Dodger fan, began his unsolicited management of the Mets when, while setting records in reverse, they came to Shea Stadium. In succeeding seasons, the Mets have turned over more players than new leagues, and Earhart has accumulated over 130 signs. Seven years with the Mets have given a mordant edge to his humor. As worn at the edges as some beloved volume is the banner which he hoists after Met losses. After a busy day of making signs for commerce, he takes a busman's holiday at home, carving from cardboard the exhortations which he feels may, like a mule skinner's whip, a hussar's spur, or the halftime scorn of a football coach, drive his team to greater effort. Do you think you feel more a part of the game when you're doing this kind of thing, a part of the whole picture? Oh, yes, definitely. Well, you feel you're, you're, you're talking to the players because they may not uh, look like they see it, but it's there and they got to see it. They may not hear you, but they'll see it. And this way we communicate. And all the fans that sit around us, uh, I feel we be become all one we're like saying the same thing at the same time. But you started doing this because the Mets were a bad team. True. Yeah, we, we wanted to needle them. We were 
like all the Met fans, we were frustrated. We sat in the stands looking for the wins, and they never came. And if they become a good team, you'll stop needling them. Very likely, very likely, because, uh, well, that's our aim, to have a good team. Once we have a good team, we don't need to needle them anymore. You know? With his son, Rich, he loads the car's trunk with an appropriate assortment of adjurations and sets off for the ballpark with the cheery briskness of the dedicated. The load of signs he carries numbers few bouquets, but as a fan, he always hopes these will be in constant use. Established in a strategic spot, he riffles the file tabs, which permit him to be properly selective about the nature of the lightning bolts he hurls at the enemy, the fates, and on occasion into the Met dugout. One might think that eight seasons with the Mets is already in a class with Job's boils, but Ed Cranepool has the extra affliction of being Earhart's favorite target. He has a sign all his own, which names him, to all who can read one-foot letters, Super Stiff. We have a lot of fans that come out and support the ball club they have since 1962. I know for myself, uh, it hadn't been that much fun because they've been on me the last two years. Even during the ball game, certainly uh, some of these fellas that are waving their signs around, you can uh, pick one or two of them up. Uh, it doesn't bother me that much. Of course, I've seen them, and uh, it is a little annoying, but uh, if that's all some of these people got to do is make signs to ridicule players who are really trying to do their best out there, I feel sorry for them. I think the fans are just trying to uh, kind of wake you up a little bit, but they don't realize that you are trying to do your best out there. No one likes to make out, but uh, they're out there to have a good time and you really can't blame them. They pay their money to come out to see us play and uh, if you're doing poorly, you certainly like to improve yourself and try to get the fans on your side. Since his team has a record akin to that of Charlie Brown's Motley Nine, the sloganeer chooses much of his material from the collection of heart cries which the Peanuts players have vented in Met-like situations. Others have a flavor of the older, simpler days when baseball fans felt that loud noises at the right moment would fill the bill. In a classic age, the Greeks had time for orations. But in our hurry-up times, we support a variety of causes, fanatical, far-out, furious, and funny, with signs. <laughs> I am rarely speechless, but this time, this is Haywood Hale Brun at Shea Stadium in New York. The Mets turn up the heat on their September drive, and New York and a nation are awestruck. Next on Woody's World, the Miracle Mets. rinse this morning? If you did, your mouth will thank you. Listerine doesn't just put a spring in your step, it also significantly reduces gingivitis and plaque. <sighs> say goodbye to germs. Oh. And say good morning to Listerine. Unlike other materials, healthy skin is able to become more resilient. Vaseline Men helps fortify skin, so instead of breaking down, it can grow stronger. Vaseline Men Lotions, for stronger, more resilient skin. as top contenders must win to keep their PCS Bowl dreams alive. Saturday Night Football on ABC, presented by Southwest Airlines, Oregon, Arizona, or Kansas, Texas, Saturday at 8 Eastern, college football lives here. Statements by President Obama indicated that he's going to confront the current economic crisis head on by taking all necessary steps to ease the credit crisis, help hardworking families, and restore growth and prosperity. If you have more than $10,000 in credit card debt, time is not on your side. Take the first step by calling the Debt Relief Helpline now. Debt management programs have been effective in helping individuals and families just like yours get their lives back on track. So call the number on the screen now. In just minutes, a debt settlement representative will go over the many options available to you. Options that include setting up a payoff plan with your existing creditors to reduce past penalties and late fees and lower your interest rates. So get your life back on track now. Time isn't on your side, so don't wait. This is the perfect time to develop a plan and help you make that first step toward financial freedom. So don't wait. Make the call now. For the first years of their existence, the Mets earned some derisive nicknames, like the New York Mutts. But as the 1969 season progresses, 
the mutts really do become the amazons. Woody always felt that baseball was, more than anything else, a game of statistics. And as the Mets' September drive gets into high gear, Woody is aware of the most glaring statistic of all. The Mets have never been in first place. Not ever. Behind the bland, blank facades of New York's big buildings, businessmen, diplomats, and other movers and shakers are so busy with the assorted excitements of decision-making that it sometimes seems difficult to turn them outward to the innocent, general excitement of sport. This week, however, the upward rush of the Mets united the skyscraper people with the barbershop, barroom, and bleacher sets, which had seen the miracle begin. Together, they made a compact block of hysteria. Business types grabbed for baseballs as if they were checks at the big client luncheon. Fans who used to want nothing from the Mets but a little wry amusement now fought for garments that gave off the secret shine of success. What might have been an ordinary argument in April becomes a human windmill in the tornado of a tight race. No one admits to being superstitious, but who wants a black cat around at such a moment? This one darted in front of the Cub dugout, and perhaps coincidentally, the league leaders began making the mistakes that league leaders rarely make. The frustrations of a losing streak stick out like bits of broken glass as Randy Hundley drops his bat after strike three. Through the years of their ineptitude, the Mets were loved like old, eyeless, stuffed animals, and played like them, too. But now they break rallies with balletic stretches, and the falling pitcher at first base holds the ball despite all for another out. Bunts, which used to be treated like live bombs, are now scooped up with ease. The crucial series used to be something the Mets saw on TV, but this week the doormat had become a flying carpet as the Cubs came to town to play two with a two and a half game lead. The importance of the series was zippily underlined when Bill Hands sharp shot the first Met batter, Tommy Agee. Met pitcher Jerry Kuzman responded in slightly more than kind by vigorously slapping the wrist of the next available Cub, Ron Santo. Agee made his reply when next up with a two-run homer to give his team an early lead. Later, with the fire which has turned a funny ball club into a furious force, Agee stretched a single into a double which eventually provided the winning run. The pitching star of this first game was Jerry Kuzman, who finished it with the flourish of a 13th strikeout and sent the yells and dreams soaring up into the night sky. The next night, nearly 60,000 jammed Shea Stadium. With the cool gaiety of bullfight fans, they waved white handkerchiefs at old hero Leo DeRocher, the Cub manager, and called derisive goodbyes. When Tom Seaver pitched a masterful 21st victory to bring the Mets within two percentage points of the lead, Leo was probably happy to say goodbye himself. After the many years in which a trip to ninth place was a rare and thrilling outing, the Mets and their fans are a little startled at the bright lights of the heights, but they're adjusting. I think it's the maturity in the guys. Uh, they're all, all young. We're all young. And, of course, I'm an old guy in this ball club at 27. We expected to maybe finish uh, in the middle of the pack and uh, maybe not have a shot at anything, really. Uh, we, of course, this was based on my first four years with the New York Mets, and um, even, even, even that was a, an optimistic outlook. The New York fans either want the best or the worst. I don't think they want anything mediocre. And uh, when we were the worst, they loved us. And now that we're possibly the best, I think they'll love us. And uh, I think it'll continue this way. Playing next against Montreal, the team which reminds historians of yesterday's Mets, today's Mets had a chance for the first time in their history to be alone on the icy peak of first place. Perhaps a bit frazzled by their heroics against Chicago, they advanced toward the throne with the uncertain step of a farm boy in a carnival funhouse. They crept to a tie in the fifth inning on a disputed balk, which brought about a brisk debate and another of those handkerchief displays that make Shea look like Harvard Stadium. The stagger became a trudge, and the Mets, egged on by their marching cry, hung on doggedly into extra innings. They showed a flash of brilliance as they cut off a run in the top of the 12th. And they exploded into first place as Mets spikes cut into the plate and Expo Harks 
and the last of the 12th gave everyone a wonderful moment of madness. For Chicago, it was the first day this year out of first place. For the Mets, whatever the future will bring, the first day in it. A team which has fought its way from being a joke, being a club which can take victory calmly, and which can make its owner, Mrs. Joan Payson, swagger like a musketeer, can well ponder the words of Francis Bacon. He conquers twice, who upon victory conquers himself. This is Haywood Hale Brune at Shea Stadium. The Mets make it to the World Series. When Woody's World, the Miracle Mets return. Gentlemen, this is vodka. Some men know when to step aside. Inspired by 300 years of tradition. Kettle One. Please drink responsibly. What if the person of your dreams is out there waiting for you? And what if this weekend only, eHarmony introduced you to that person absolutely free? Announcing the free communication weekend from eHarmony, where we match you with other singles based on 29 dimensions of compatibility, like intellect, values and character and this weekend only you can communicate with your compatible matches for free the eHarmony free communication weekend this Thursday through Sunday four days only so get started today at eHarmony.com Medicare it doesn't cover everything and what it doesn't cover can cost you some money that's why you should consider an AARP Medicare supplement insurance plan insured by United Healthcare Insurance Company it can help cover some of what Medicare doesn't, so you could save up to thousands of dollars in out-of-pocket expenses. Call now for this free information kit and Medicare guide. If you're turning 65 or you're already on Medicare, you should know about this card. It's the only one of its kind that carries the AARP name. See if it's right for you. You choose your doctor. You choose your hospital. There are no networks and no referrals needed. Help protect yourself from some of what Medicare doesn't cover. Save up to thousands of dollars on potential out-of-pocket expenses with an AARP Medicare Supplement Insurance Plan, insured by United Healthcare Insurance Company. Call now for your free information kit and Medicare guide and find out how you could start saving. History is here like never before. It's time to feel the rarest of the rare, the surest of the sure, and the best of the best. Feel the fourth of four straight, the Ford 400 at Homestead, Miami, Sunday at 2.30 Eastern on ABC. ESPN, your NBA destination. Don't miss a doubleheader featuring Cavs Wizards, followed by Spurs Mavericks, tonight at 7 Eastern. The Miracle Mets, the Amazons, Destiny's Darlings, the superlatives alone almost guarantee the Mets the pennant. The sweep of Atlanta in the playoffs and a date with the favorite Orioles in the World Series. For former manager Casey Stengel, who suffered through the early days, was this retribution? Yes. I thought I'd say it, but I thought they'd put two more tears on by now, see? We got to put two more tears up here. It's getting too crowded. We can't get out here. Game four at Shea Stadium. The Mets ahead, two games to one. Woody is on the scene. It's easier to become accustomed to victory than to defeat. And Met fans radiated an uncharacteristic smugness today as they watched a team which had never lost a postseason game at home. Their complacence appeared justified when Don Clendenin hit a second inning home run, the kind which had all its rockets firing as it crossed the fence. The fans yelled their told you so's. Tom Seaver pitched steadily, and when he was a little less than steady, there were the mighty Met outfielders, this time Cleon Jones, to gallop to the rescue. Even more vital a gallop was a desperation dash by the third outfielder, Ron Swoboda, which stopped a ninth-inning Baltimore rally at no more than the tying run. In the home tent, J.C. Martin, another of the Met understudies who have been giving Barrymore performances all year, laid down a perfect bunt. When it got away from the Orioles, the Mets had a two-to-one victory and a feeling that the unbelievable was nothing of the kind. This is Haywood Hale Brune at the World Series.
Game five is to be the last at Shea Stadium, and a raucous, rollicking crowd desperately wants to see the almost worst to best, the Miracle Mets, desperately wants to see them win it at home. It is Thursday, October 16th, 1969. Here is Walter Cronkite. Daniel Classic. Haywood Hale Broom reports the incredible. It is here that the World Series has had its greatest moments. Here in a Shea Stadium outfield, which the Mets have covered as if they had seven league boots, fireman's nets, and help from the elves. These are Mets of different metal, and losing their caps instead of their cool, they kept on arriving at the right moment, even when, as it so often was, it was the last moment. Now to Baltimore fans, the fates appeared to be walking across the skies carrying a Met banner. The Met rocket rose slowly from the pad in the sixth when Cleon Jones won an argument about being hit by a pitch. And then Met Power made its first appearance as Don Clendenin hit his third home run of the series, a blow which later won in the car, which goes to the series star. In the seventh, Met Power made an unexpected appearance as Al Weiss hit his third home run of the year to tie the game and tighten everyone's strings to E above high C. An inning later, the strings began to tune up for the Met victory song. Cleon Jones struck the drum of the center field wall for a double. When Swoboda followed with another double, everyone but the Orioles knew that Shea Stadium, of all places, was the home of the world's baseball champion. Baltimore did get the tying run to the plate in the ninth, but the outfield cavalry was ready for the final charge, which cut him off at the pass, ended a 5-3 ball game, and started the leaping, cascading fires in front of celebration. Suddenly, 57,000 fans seemed to have made their way from stands to field. All of them were determined to show as much dash as had their heroes, and they swirled in zigzags of ecstatic revel. In the clubhouse, the Mets flung aloft the symbols of their new eminence, and then it was time for the champagne, the liquid that nobody ever drinks on these occasions. To the Mets, it was the shower of champions. I think we should save this one because this is a sweet one. This was the first one, and I don't think it'll ever be this nice again. You weren't you are supposed to win it. We weren't supposed to do anything this year, but we did it all. Did it all! Wall Street, ever glad to get rid of computer readout paper and warmed by the averages, went mad for the Mets in a most unbusinesslike way. It would have been a very poor time to call your broker. It usually takes the end of a year or the end of a war to rouse this old town. But the Mets did it today by ending victoriously the 1969 World Series. This is Haywood Hale Brun in New York. So what happens to Destiny's Darlings after the last of the champagne has been drunk? Well, some of them decide they don't want the celebration to end. Here's Woody with the concluding chapter of the Miracle Mets. It's a long way from the simple heroics of Shea Stadium to the bright lights of places like Las Vegas. But then it's a long way from the dank depths to the wonders of a world's championship. And the Mets are enjoying a whole bright new world on the half shell. Hey, who gonna put my makeup on for me? While some Mets found themselves booked to speak at advanced prices on advanced subjects, others, cloaked in the all-purpose prowess which makes actors of athletes and politicians of actors, started their show business careers at the top this winter. All right, let's go out, fellas. Drawing $10,000 each for a two-week engagement at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. Here's a team at the beginning of the season. They were 200 to 1 underdogs, and nobody wanted to bet on them. it appears that the only 300 hitter in the group is the soprano who drowns the earnest athletes with a careless brio the Baltimore Orioles never managed. This is Haywood Hale Brune. When we were the worst they loved us. Once we have a good team we don't need a needle them anymore. A team which can make its owner Mrs. Joan Payson swagger like a musketeer and well ponder the words of Francis Bacon. He conquers twice, who upon victory conquers himself.